do that. Righto, happy days. Um, it didn't actually say what this presentation was about. Um, it's about the Groot Island Biosecurity Program. Um, so we're going to talk to you about the work that we're doing up on Groot Island in the Northern Territory. Uh, but like I say, first of all, this isn't Constantine, it's Tommy Barra. Um, and I'm stoked he's here with me today. So give him a big clap. He's stepped up for us and, yeah, um, absolute champion. So um, we'll start off with... Here we go. Um, our island home, and I'll let Tommy talk about that. So. Um, Groot Island is in the uh, Gulf of Carpentaria, uh, Carpentaria in the Northern Territory, situated about 60 kilometres off the East, East Arnhem Land coastline, and it is home to about 14 clan groups of the Groot Archipelago. Uh, the Ellen Diliokwa is the first spoken language over in Groot Island. Um, as you can see, I identify and Philip have been working for the Rangers about 17 years. Uh, they retired in about 2020. And they're now our cultural advisors for the Rangers. And uh, it's very unfortunate they can't be here today. And yeah. yeah. Good job, Tommy. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, they were both very honoured that um, we got the opportunity to present on the program. Um, and yeah, like I say, we wish old man a speedy recovery. He's a, a very important old man for us at, uh, at the Ranger program. Um, our Ranger team, uh, we work across 10,000 square kilometres of pristine Northern Territory bush and ocean. Uh, the land and sea country up there is absolutely remarkable. Um, we've got 10 full-time Rangers who undertake a variety of natural and cultural resource management and biosecurity plays a very significant part of protecting the biodiversity values of that remarkable slice of Northern Australia. Um, the IPA boundary there, you can see on the screen, um, encompasses about 45 islands within the Groot Archipelago um, and the Indigenous protected area. Uh, and that on the very far left there is, um, is mainland Australia, East Arnhem Land. Um, there are three main communities on Groot and we've got rangers that work across those areas. Um, we've got a ranger coordinator and a crew to the, um, to the east of the island and a base on the west side of the island as well. Um, and in the future, um, through funding through National Indigenous Australians Agency working on country program, we'll broaden that across the Millie Akbar on Bickerton Island as well um, and have a ranger group set up there as well. So really important work. Um, and like I said before, we're on the front line of... Um, of that stuff up there. No one else is there, so we're up there to protect it um, with the guys and girls. Um, the program itself commenced in February 2017, and it's a uni unique collaboration between the Andaliaqua Land Council, the Land and Sea Rangers, and South 32 Gemco. South 32 have a manganese mine up on Groot. Uh, it's the largest mang or most profitable manganese mine in the world. Yep, and it's been there a long time, about 60 years. Um, South 32 acknowledge the, the risks that they play with island biosecurity. They bring the most amount of people to Groot. They bring the most amount of stuff to Groot. And this collaboration has been set up to share the responsibility of biosecurity across the Groot archipelago with all stakeholders. Um, we aim to protect values. And I'm going to touch and drill into those values a bit. But it's the way that we see how we can best mainstream biosecurity and make biosecurity everyone's responsibility. Um, look, we're setting a high standard in island biosecurity and we're really happy and proud of where we've got to as a group. Um, we're the finalists in 2019 for the best collaboration in Territory Natural Resource Management. Um, we won the Australian Government Biosecurity Award last year uh, for Best Environmental Biosecurity Program. Um, we won the 2021 Partnerships in Landcare Award in the Northern Territory and um, finalists tonight for the national one. So, fingers crossed. And, uh, yeah... See how we go. See how we go. So, um, yeah, like I said, I'm going to drill into those environmental values slightly, um, all those values of, of, the, uh, of Groot Archipelago. Um, Groot has a very, very high biodiversity and conservation value, and that's due to the absence of many threatened, uh, sorry, of many introduced and invasive species. Um, you can see there on the screen we have over 900 plant and 300 invertebrate species. And when we actually look towards our sea country as well, um, we have a fish diversity and abundance of similar to the Great Barrier Reef, um, southern areas of the Great Barrier Reef. There are 12 threatened species and endangered species on Groot, and some of them do not occur anywhere else in the world. 
and there's places on Groot where you can take two steps off of a main road or a track and find evidence of northern hopping mice that haven't been seen on the mainland since 1976. Um, northern quails, genuinely abundant on Groot Island and that's because we don't have any cane toads. Um, it's not uncommon for us to go out and have to get quails out of wheelie bins or go and put the traps out at the shop or the um, local recreation club or the golfie because they're getting into the chockey, rap uh, chockey bars and, um, and causing a bit of a nuisance. So, um, interestingly, I'll touch a bit more on quails later on, but the absence of cane toads and the abundance of quails is, yeah, uh, obviously goes hand in hand. So, um, we do a lot of monitoring programs and surveys for threatened species uh, within our IPA. And as I said before, that work is primarily funded by the National Indigenous Australians Agency through the Commonwealth Government. As I touched on, the absence and good biosecurity is key to um, a healthy biodiversity value. Um, economic value. Look, everything on Groot for the last 60 years has been driven by mining. Um, now, future Groot, post mining, is something that the Land Council and more broadly all stakeholders on Groot are looking towards. What's going to sustain Groot Island into the future? Um, there are several, several economic opportunities there, but all of these are hinged again on effective biosecurity and good biosecurity. Uh, we can look at a number of things here. Um, the photo down in the bottom left um, is an oyster farm that the rangers worked with NT Fisheries to set up as a feasibility. Is it viable to farm black lip oysters on Groot Island? Poor aquatic biosecurity and the introdu introduction of invasive or introduced aquatic pests will impact on those industries into the future. So we need to be careful around our aquatic risks. Um, the photo in the middle there is Constantine in the grey shirt and Terence um, undertaking turtle tracking activities down with Ames. That was um, last October. Um, and this is another area of economic opportunity, ecotourism. We have the largest green turtle rookery in the Northern Territory and we have the largest hawksbill rookery in the Northern Territory and have five out of the seven species of sea turtles that utilise our waters around the Groot IPA. Um, so it's really important that we have effective biosecurity to protect, like I say, these economic values. If feral pigs were to establish on Groot Island, as we've seen in the Cape, 100% predation of turtle nests at Pomperia. 100%, no turtles getting back into the water. And that's detrimental to that species and, uh, and those endangered and vulnerable species that sea turtles are. Um, other things are sustainable forestry enterprises like sandalwood um, and looking at other ways it's going to be economically viable to support um, like Groot Island and traditional owners and their families into the future uh, post mining. Cultural values. Tommy's the best placed person to talk about those, <laughs> so I'll step to this side. The Wanandiliakwa people have a strong connection to culture, language and country. The social values such as what we do on the weekends or even at home can be impacted by invasive and introduced species. Uh, the absence of many introduced and in invasive species is vital for social and cultural values for future generations. Good stuff. Exactly right. Um, we touched on the feral pig impacts to turtles. Uh, obviously, traditional owners going out and practicing their, uh, their culture and collecting turtle egg and going and collecting turtle. Um, it's, it's that connection to country which is so important on Groot and connection to culture. And that's something that, as an outsider living on Groot Island for five and a half years now, I've been fully immersed in and, and you see that genuine connection to, to language, to country and to culture. And I think that comes down to the successes of this program is that shared responsibility and awareness of what these things will do to um, you know, what we see here. Um, and what we've seen on the mainland the, probably the biggest thing that we want to drive home today is the wars that were lost on the mainland with invasive and introduced species are the battles that we continue to fight on Groot Island. Um, and that's something that I think, unfortunately, in some areas gets forgotten. Once something here is pitched as eradication and then phases out to management because we lost, the, we lost that and then it gets passed down the line to council and community groups, is the stuff that we're still fighting over there. Um, and like I say, our biggest, or one of our biggest threats, is the cane toad. Um, Groot Archipelago is the last, one of the last island groups in northern Australia that is free of cane toads. South 32, Gemco, classify cane toad establishment on Groot as one of their top business material risks. 
Now, let me put this into perspective for you. And most people don't get this. And I'll be honest, most people in the mining sector don't get it either. When they see a level six risk flash up on the risk matrix, that triggers alarm bells as a multi, on the le risk level, as a, um, a serious event where multiple people have lost their lives. People then look at that and what we classify cane toad establishment on group is irreversible environmental damage. And the business categorise cane toad establishment as a level six. That's very, very, there's only two, this is the top two risk for the business. Um, and that's very, very important for us and a commitment of South 32 Gemco's basically environmental awareness about the land that they were given or agreed to mine um, and what they will hand back to, to um, Andiliakwa people when they leave um, Groot Island. Um, we have a range of Kanto biosecurity activities that we implement uh, and that's to basically ensure that we manage that risk appropriately. Um, some of the photos there which we'll jump into, um, the top one there was in 2018 and that was our, 2017 sorry, um, that was our singest, single largest incursion or detection of cane toads on Groot Island. In that one plastic container, there is potentially, in one breeding event, 80,000 cane toads. Two females, one male, is what we had there. And that came in the back of, over, in the back of a car from Numbawa on the mainland in a blown out tyre that was still on the rim. Um, through our awareness activities, um, the guys there um, were able to open up the back door of their car and see that there was a cane toad sitting on the back seat, closed it up, rung us, we went out there and found the other two. Um, so that was, a, like I say, a pretty significant event for us and it could have been a real game changer. Um, the critter down on the bottom right was our last live incursion, which was a cane toad in a boot that came over in a gentleman um, from Darwin. Uh, picked up his boots off the back doorstep, threw them in his bag and yeah, there was a female cane toad hiding inside his boot. So the risk is very real and it's something, like I say, that we manage very closely and carefully. This is a bit of a pictorial sort of demonstration of some of our biosecurity uh, measures. And the Swiss cheese model, I'm sure you're all aware of it. Um, the more slices of cheese that have holes in it, you get the picture. It's on the, it's on, on the screen there. Uh, but basically what we need to do is ensure that we have all these controls in place to stop cane toads from making their way to Groot Island. And this is a demonstration of how we manage our barge freight. Um, so you'll see here in Darwin, where most of our freight comes from, uh, we have cane toad exclusion fencing um, around all of our main freight ports, uh, basically where stuff's brought over. So Sea Swift, Auriga, Centurion, all have cane toad fencing to exclude cane toads from getting in and around their freight ports. Uh, we have cane toad trapping in those areas to ensure any toads that are in there are hopefully secured in traps with water in them to an attractant. And we have visual inspections on freight, awareness messaging, um, and again, a number of visual inspections as that stuff comes across to Groot. Once it lands on Groot, we have a cane toad containment fence. So it's an area where freight cannot leave until it meets my offsider, um, Edna, who's our cane toad detection dog, which we'll learn a bit more in a moment. Um, like I say, we've got a whole range of things in there, but when we come to the back side of this is awareness. Awareness is key. We're a land and sea ranger department of 10 uh, with the coordinators, and there are a few environmental specialists within GEMCO, but there are 1,500 people on Groot Island. There are eyes and ears on the ground, and that's what we're reliant on, is awareness of our program, awareness of what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to protect. And that's really the key here, is around sharing, um, sharing the responsibility and creating that awareness. Um, a bit more on Kanto biosecurity. Like I said before, we've got the fencing, um, the awareness stuff, and a new technology advancement with eDNA water monitoring. So in the wet season now, we go out, we take water samples as a basically a proof of freedom to ensure that we haven't had something slip past, but also we've got that there for response. If someone says, I think I saw a cane toad in that you know, creek or that river or over here, we can do water monitoring to basically try and detect that cane toad DNA in the water. And it's been really effective for us in the trials we did. Uh, we headed up to Dimaru, um, up at um, Gove, Nullumboy, um, and did the trials up there and we'd be able to detect cane toad DNA and, um, and we did some trials on Groot. So yeah, like I say, we try and promote as much as we can around this program and ensure everybody is aware. Catching up with school kids, signage, you name it. Um, yeah, we've shouted it from the rooftops. Um, here's my offsider, 
Um, Edna? Edna's a seven now? Yeah, she's just turned seven. Um, so seven-year-old golden Labrador. She's been on group for nearly six years, the same amount of time as me. Um, she was specially trained by Craig A. Murray in Brisbane. Um, and like I say, she's been up on group now for nearly six years. She's used to basically check all of our high-risk barge freight, um, construction equipment, vehicles, palletised freight, flat racks, things where cane toads can jump on and off. Um, or be inadvertently wrapped up or in stormwater pipes or you name it. So we basically go down and we screen all of the freight that comes onto Groot Island. Um, she's trained and maintained on a passive indication, and that, that basically means, thanks mate, is she'll lay down when she gets on odour. And she's trained to actually point with her nose to the strongest origin of odour. So as her handler, I can look at her and she's saying to me, hey, it's here or hey, it's here. So um, yeah, we're very, very lucky to have her. Um, she's a true golden girl for us. And um, yeah, another 12 months, um, and we've got another dog coming on board in the next month called Icon, who's a Springer Spaniel. So he'll be a handful for the, uh, the new handler that we're looking for. So um, anyway, the other biosecurities act other activities. Um, Tommy Barra was out with NARCS, Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy, not that long ago, undertaking plant health surveys, looking for plant pests. Um, like I say, our community engagement and awareness, um, our ghost net and marine debris activities that we monitor for aquatic pests coming down from Southeast Asia and Indonesia. A photo there is an example of a five tonne ghost net that we removed from the waters of the Andiliaqua, um, sorry, the Grid Archipelago. Um, invasive ant surveys, uh, you know, and Personally, I wish this program had been implemented 50 years ago. Unfortunately, we do have some species there, but we're working hard about how we can best manage those. But you dealt the hands that you, the cards that you dealt. So, um, like I say, we undertake feral cat management. We're trialling Felixer devices at the moment. Feral cats and Asian house geckos are our two established um, invasive species um, or vertebrates. Um, but our feral cat density is considered to be low. So we're doing a lot of work trying to figure out why that may be, if our healthy dingo population is controlling that, um, or if there are other factors around that as well. So um, where are we at here? Uh, plant biosecurity. Um, like I said, we're relatively free from most of those introduced and invasive plants. Weeds such as gamba grass represent a significant risk to the biodiversity values on group. Um, you see in that bottom left photo there is one of our rangers, Jeremiah, looking at some gamba grass in Darwin, a greater Darwin region. We've had five incursions of gamba, um, which is pretty significant considering how far away geographically we are from Darwin region. So we're gamba free. All those areas are under surveillance and we have no established gamba infestations on Groot Island. But like I say, they represent a significant risk. Uh, we undertake a range of preventative activities to ensure that stuff coming to Groot is clean. And right now, uh, basically, if it comes to Groot and it's dirty, it gets sent back on the barge. The program's been in place long enough now for people to know what we're doing and what we're aiming for. And basically, if it's not compliant, then Groot Island is Aboriginal freehold land. Um, the local people, traditional owners, don't want that stuff there. Um, and as such, we'll act on their interests and send that back to Darwin and get it cleaned and they can have another go. Um, the future for us is continue to work, and continue to work together and to keep all these invasive and introduced critters, plants, animals, diseases off of group and showcase what can be achieved when TOs, communities and stakeholders work together, especially with industry. Um, I've had people say to me before, oh, what's it like working with a mine? It's actually really good. Um, you know, the GEMCO have been there for a long time and their social values, like I say, and environmental values are up there. Um, so I definitely think people should think outside the square and what can be achieved when, when people work together. We're having an expansion of the program. We're currently recruiting to a, another biosecurity officer. And as I said, another detection dog coming on board. But the biggest thing we see is that while government play a part in this, we can't rely on government to do all this stuff for us. So what we're looking for is talking to government about specific island biosecurity that helps us achieve and gives us some teeth um, when we're talking about biting. Um, to help us enforce and, um, and ensure compliance with, with the things we're trying to do up there. Um, I think, oh, I've gone back one. That's us. Thanks very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed that.
Oh. Okay, it's probably gone out on country. It's probably the most. Yeah, just going out on country. It's probably the most beautiful thing you could ever do and see. So yeah. Any other questions? Or? I've got a question. Um, how are you? Oh, yep. You get a microphone. Can you do it? Yeah, they've got one coming for you. Right there. <laughs> okay. Uh, the question. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. The question is. Oh, I'll use it as well. Okay, right. Uh, the question is, um, how are you preserving knowledge, developing knowledge, and ensuring it's passed on? Yep. Um, so through the Ranger Program, we're guided by the ALC Board, uh, but also a Cultural Advisory Committee and a Plan of Management. So everything we do has basically been um, discussed, agreed to by traditional owners, and that, that basically guides our, what we do as a ranger group. Um, with regards to the biosecurity program, we're talking about things here that local mob don't have an understanding of or haven't seen impact their country. So a lot of the time, for example, uh, we're talking about, say, feral pigs. A family on the mainland have feral pigs as pets at Numbawa. Um, they have feral piglets running around community. So we've had a few examples or instances where family go over there, they see a piglet and they bring it back to Groot and want it as a pet. So it's up to us to go in and do that, I suppose, our knowledge of the impacts of pigs and what they can do to country and the impacts they've had on the mainland and work with traditional owners and within the range of program to, you know, basically deliver that education and get that engagement. Um, to touch on other, uh, the other element of your program, the, oh, sorry, of your question. The program is situated where it's situated as a legacy. Um, South 32 could have done this internally, had a biosecurity officer, had a cane toad dog. They tried that, didn't quite work out. But not only that, the program is set up as a legacy piece to basically ensure that post mining, there's a strong framework there for knowledge transfer both ways with the rangers and through you know, me coming on board with that biosecurity skill set to ensure we are forming this up to be sustainable into the future and long lasting. So there is recognition of the rangers as knowledge holders? 100%, yeah, uh, not, not only knowledge holders, as land owners and custodians and, you know, we're not, the, the, the it's been a, an eye opener for me going to Groot Island where I've been up the Cape numerous times and travelled around Australia you land on Groot Island and you very, very quickly realise that you're in someone else's backyard. You're on Aboriginal freehold land. You can only go to these areas. And if you want to go elsewhere, you have to seek permission. That's good. Yeah. Because it's, you know, like I say, it's, it's these guys' island and we're there to provide our knowledge and skill set in that areas, you know, like I say, biosecurity in this instance and land management, but also it's a two-way learning. I'll probably quickly, if I've got time, I'll probably run out of time. Um, we did an AIMS project um, where we looked at mapping of the sea country around Groot. Mm. And the first thing they did is when they came in is they spoke to TOs and asked them to map their sea country. What's where? Where's your seagrass? Where do these fish live? Where do you find dugong? Where do you look for turtle? And basically had TOs sit down with a big map of Groot Island and basically circle and say where they find these things. The fancy boats go out there with their sounders and depth things and this and that and the other and the GoPros going underwater to do fish surveys and you overlay the two maps and they're exactly the same. The traditional knowledge of their country um, and the connection to their country is so strong that your Western science basically just says, hey, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Um, so we're just using our methods and our technology to basically work in with their culture and their history and their knowledge of, of, um, of country. Any other questions? Thank you very much for that. Um, you talked about feral cats. Do you have a problem with wild dogs, firstly? And secondly, do you have any cultural tourism activities? Um, sorry, was that cultural tourism activities? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, touch on, so yeah, feral cats, the density is considered to be low. 
Um, I'll give you an example of that. We had 127 sites for a camera trapping program with the Northern Territory Government. Um, we detected quolls at 127 sites. We detected cats at eight. Um, so that's really good. Um, we'll put camera traps out in the bush and we'll get loads and loads of native animals. We'll put cat traps out. We'll get loads and loads of quolls and bandicoots. But cats are pretty hard to come by, um, which is good. Whether our dingoes um, are... Um, yeah, wild dogs. We have, more recently, we've had a few instances of problem wild dogs around communities. Um, but again, you go outside a community and hit the tracks and get across the aisle and we'll see really good looking dingoes. Um, there are dog tracks on you know, every vehicle track that you drive on. Um, and I think that they probably are playing, hopefully, a key role in controlling that cat population. Um, unfortunately, we tried our best to keep a lichiosis off of Groot Island. Um, we implemented a range of measures to stop that tick disease that affects dogs, uh, but unfortunately it made its way to Groot. Um, and we really, really hope that the dingo population doesn't get affected by that. Um, we do undertake some wild dog management activities around town, but we engage with the police if required. And we've had a domestic dog that was killed by dingoes, um, and we have to manage that human-wildlife conflict at the interface. So, um, tourism. Uh, the main, main tourism on Groot at the moment is the fishing tourism. Good fishing up there. Um, in the future, ecotourism, we look at Mon Repo and things like that, of you know, being able to get people up there to these huge turtle rookeries. Um, glamping, there's lots of things in the pipeline there for future Groot. Um, we just need to look at how that's going to play out and balance out um, with traditional owner wishes and go from there. I've got a question for Tom. Uh, what's, your, what's the biggest threat to your marine turtles? So I work with the Wapabara Tumra and we work uh, also with Ames, so we've got a lot in common. Uh, but I'm just wondering what the biggest threat is to your marine turtles. For, for us, it's light pollution, feral animals like foxes and things like that, digging them up. But what's it like up in Groot? Well, it would mostly be the marine debris and especially um, ghost nets that come down from Southeast Asia. and. Um, um, tro uh, prawn trolls and that, that go through group. So yeah, most, mostly those. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not used to this cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> to um, jump on our Facebook page, we just did a beach clean up on Groot last weekend. Um, and the Aqualand and Sea Rangers on Facebook, if you're interested to follow us. Uh, we picked up with 160 volunteers in three hours. We picked up 3.7 tonnes of rubbish off the beach. Um, and this week, the range has been working with Sea Shepherd. We've got seven volunteers from Sea Shepherd up there for Makata campaign, which is, translates to salt water um, from Andiliakwa. And um, yeah, they've picked up, yesterday they did 700 kilos, and the day before they did nearly a tonne. So the amount of marine debris that we haven't pushed down from our northern waters is, um, is alarming. And we're trying to, again, another element of our program we're trying to promote um, and raise awareness of that environmental and, um, issue, especially towards sea turtles. Awesome. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.